guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. Today's episode is all about tips for preparing for a medical coding job interview. If you are brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. Okay guys, so scrolling through social media, I saw a post this weekend that I want to share um, because it hits on a lot of things that I think are very important. And this is from an interviewer's point of view as well. So I think this is wonderful because this, this tells you everything that you need to know. And it also reiterates everything that I've been saying, because I have been telling you guys that working with these books, these coding manuals is very important. Knowing how to navigate in these books is very, very key. Even with the electronic health record and the computer assisted coding and the encoder and all of these things, these electronic tools, because that's exactly what they are, is tools to help you to code and code more efficiently and code more specifically. They're not the end all be all. They're not infallible. We still have to know the coding guidelines and the rules and everything. We still have to know how to use the books so that we can verify and make sure because sometimes these codes that are selected are not gonna make sense. And even when you go through an encoder, if you don't know what you're doing and you select the wrong path, it's gonna take you to the wrong code. Well, a coder who's not doing their research is just gonna take it at face value that this is the code it gave me, so I'm gonna use this code. And sometimes that code is not gonna be correct. And if you're not doing your research enough to know the difference, then you, know, you could end up potentially giving a wrong code. So that's something to pay attention to. But this is the thing, this is, this is a time that coders and new coders and coding students need to be really aware is that there's a lot of talk in the industry like all of this AI and all of this technology is going to be taken over, taken over, taken over. And what they don't realize is that a lot of these things are wrong. A lot of these codes that are selected through these computer assisted coding and all this stuff, and even in the electronic health record, a lot of times it's wrong. And it depends on the training of the provider as well, because a lot of times they're going in and selecting a code because that's what the EHR, the electronic health record, needs them to do in order to be able to close out the encounter. The doctor is not meant to be a coder. And so because of that, we have jobs as coders, right? And so it's our job to know. Would it be helpful if the provider selected the correct code? Obviously, but they don't have to know everything because that's not their, that's not their job. Their job is to make sure that they manage the care of the patient. That's what they're supposed to do. We are the ones who are supposed to manage what they document and make sure that those codes are correct. So because of that, we have to have this book knowledge. We have to have knowledge of how to use a CAC. We have to know how to use the um, electronic health record. We have to know how to use the encoder. So the CAC, the encoder, and the, um, the electronic health record, these are all tools, okay? These are all tools. And knowing how to use these and navigate them and, and validate whether it's correct or not correct, it's, it's very important for coders, but again, it's not the end all be all. But this post I really like because again, it's pointing out from the view of the interviewer. And this is something that I've been telling you guys and you guys need to pay attention to. Make sure that when you are getting out there and you are interviewing and you're getting prepared for an interview, that you know how to at least verbalize, how to look up codes, how do you find procedures in the book? How do you find modifiers? Do you know when to apply modifiers? These are things that should come to you naturally, whether you have experience or whether you don't have experience. It still should be able to come to you naturally. It's not an excuse of, well, I went through a four month program and no one taught me and no one trained me. That victim mentality has to go, guys. It has to go because I hear it too many times. It's sickening to me to hear it so much because everybody's like, well, no one trained me, but you can train yourself. And this is a very self-directed train yourself type deal. And then when you're learning along the way and you find other like-minded people, that's when you can start learning from each other. And that's what the community of coding is, is like, okay? But let me read this uh, comment and we'll get into it. So here we go. So the post says, let's talk about the state of coding and coding professionals knowledge or lack of. I have observed that the skill set of coding professionals has diminished due to heavy reliance on the predominant logic based encoder and CAC 
without ongoing coder education about how to properly use the tools uh, dominating our field. If you are a coding professional seeking a job and you can't code without a particular encoder, then you are not a coder. You are a glorified data entry clerk. I was shocked in a recent interview when we were talking about next steps. Our next step of if an interview is going well is to schedule the candidate for a coding assessment using books. Yes, books. More than just this recent time, the candidate's body language instantly changes and it becomes apparent that they are not confident in their skill set. We use a knowledge-based encoder, not logic-based, and are proud of that. We do have a CAC, it is best in class, but not the one that most people flock to. If you are a skilled uh, coding professional, you should be able to work in any system with any encoder, CAC, or EHR, and EHR. Um, for a candidate to say that they cannot work without a specific encoder or EHR is mind-numbing. Thoughts? Am I expecting too much or has the quality out there really sunk to an all-time low? I don't think that this person is expecting too much. I think that um, it is expected that coders, whether they are brand new or whether they are with years of experience, should know how to use the book. But <laughs> um, a lot of times these organizations are always wanting to hire these uh, people who have years of experience. And this is where you can find out that <laughs> it's not all what it's cracked up to be. Sometimes coders who have experience are only experienced in one thing and that's what they're used to and that's what they know and that's what they want to stick with because they don't want to have that feeling of, you know, not knowing something or not understanding something. They don't want to go through that. So they kind of want to stick to what they know. And because of that, their, their knowledge base becomes very limited. Okay. And so if they're putting out a job, this organization's putting out a job listing that says, uh, must have 35 years experience and again people who are brand new are not listening to me and not applying anyway I'm just saying you should go ahead and apply because the person says okay I have three to five years experience let me go ahead and apply and then I get in this interview and they say okay you got to use your books I would be like sure yeah great let's go you know but somebody else who's like oh well uh, uh and then they say oh no they need their encoder I've heard of even people saying that they need to have multiple choice when it comes to their tests. They don't want to have to do fill in the blank. Again, no, <laughs> you know, because then it's just a guessing game. Okay. So if you can't work without books, this is a problem. Okay. And organizations that are so steadfast and we only want to hire people who have experience, but are not looking at, um, brand new people or inexperienced people who at least can pass an assessment test. This is the thing. I can understand that if you're in a business and you need people and you need people now, okay, you want people who have experience. Great. Okay. Let's, let's hire people who have experience. But then of course we run across people who are in the industry who have bad habits that they've developed and who cannot use their coding manuals. Meanwhile, there is a new candidate who's taken your assessment test, pass that assessment test, and can use their coding manuals. This is a person that I'm gonna call versus a person that is stuck in their ways and doesn't wanna change and only wants to do certain things. I'm just saying. So anybody should be able to use any, any CAC, uh, computer system coding, you know, any uh, EHR, any encoder with a little bit of training. That's, that's not unheard of, okay? So um, you're, the thought of you know them, it's, it's just too much to ask for people to be able to work with books. No, I don't think that's asking too much. I think that it's, it's a need that we have to demand that coders still maintain their knowledge and still continue to study and still continue to do these things because this field changes all the time. It's not the same as it was three years ago. You know, we, we saw that when the um, evaluation and management rules changed, okay? so. There's a lot of things that change. And so for coders to be new, um, I want this to encourage you, okay? I want it to encourage you that you have a skill that you're newly trained. You know all the latest rules, okay? And it doesn't matter 
the poor training that you get from your fast paced school, you can always turn that around. There's plenty of resources out there to help you to learn anatomy, medical terminology, pathophysiology. There's all of those resources on YouTube that will, there's tons of channels that will help you. Once you start listening to these videos, like videos on cra from Crash Course, um, that's going to really help you because if you're in an interview and I ask you a question about anatomy, I am very much going to expect that question to be answered. And if you can't answer that question, that's not somebody that I'm going to look at. That's not somebody that I, I, I want to, to have on my team because, again, we have to be very proficient in medical terminology and anatomy. And if you're not, it's going to show really quick. Because it's not just about, okay, this is the name of the, of the diagnosis. Okay, well, um, let me just look it up. Sometimes it's not that way in the book. And you can find it under different terms and things like that to get to the same code. So again, being able to verbalize how to find codes and find procedure codes and explain what modifiers are and things like that, that's one of those things that these employers are looking for when they're doing an interview. Being proficient with medical terminology and anatomy and pathophysiology, that's another thing that you're going to get tested on. Even when I had my interview here with my Forever Home, that was one of the things that they did. They asked me coding questions. They asked me where to find things in the book. They asked me, what is this code range? They gave me a code range for CPT, and I had to be able to name it. And there was medical terminology questions, anatomy questions, and all other kinds of questions when it comes to those things procedure questions and things like that. And I had to be able to answer and respond to those questions. If not, I had to be able to let the person know, okay, well, I can find the answer. <laughs> I know where to find the answer in the event. I can find the answer, you know, by using this book, not, oh, I can just Google it. Cause that wouldn't have flown. <laughs> that would not fly at all. Okay. So I think we, um, leaders should continue to have high standards because a lot of times people's bar is right here for excellence your bar should be right here for excellence because again if we lower our standards and we lower um those those things those key things that coders need we are going to become unreliable as an industry if we do that we have to be able to rise above all the things that oh well they only went to a certificate program okay yes I, I went to a certificate program however a medical coder has to know what a doctor knows while never having gone to medical school and I take that very seriously that's my saying I've said that since the inception of my channel because it's the truth we have to know what doctors know while never having gone to medical school and about some of you I've just scared you off because oh no it's too hard it's too hard it's not too hard it's not too hard I came in with zero medical experience at all. I, I was so far away from even wanting to be in the medical field. I had no desires to be in the medical field, but I went to the program and I, I learned and the, the trade school that I learned medical coding had closed down. So don't ask me <laughs> what program I went to. Uh, but this is, these are things that these employers are looking at. Okay. So it's not just me saying it as far as the importance of knowledge and, and knowledge base and being able to use critical thinking. These are things that are really important. Uh, writing well, speaking well, these are two very important things. And I see it all the time. People are, are have gotten so lazy. And I don't know if it's a generational thing because I see a lot of the younger generation doing this where they're putting, uh, where it's supposed to be a capital, uh, capital letter for like a proper noun. They're making it a, a lowercase letter. I mean, it's just like, really? Why would you do that? That's that's rude. <laughs> it's rude and it's improper uh, in anything when you're writing. And to write something like that and you're writing to a doctor and then not using proper punctuation, not spelling correctly, that's another thing that I wouldn't want to hire that person either. Because, again, you're communicating with... Um, very intelligent people and every single one of those coders is a representative of that department. I would never, 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 never hire anybody who can't communicate very well with a provider. You have to be able to know this or you have to be able to use the tools that can help you to be able to communicate well. Because if you, if you don't want to 
if you don't know how to, oh, Blue, I didn't learn all that in school. Okay, well, I understand things change, right? Ever since they stopped teaching cursive writing in school. I don't understand that. I think that it's still important, and I think it's stupid that, that they stopped teaching it. But they say, oh, well, we're teaching um, computer skills. Okay, but you still have to have the ability to be able to write and read in cursive. I'm just saying, because there's still people that are writing and reading in cursive currently, you know, and so, and look at <laughs> the founding documents for our country are written in cursive. So if you can't have students to actually be able to look at this and know what it says, because it's so foreign to them, because they can't read cursive, like, really? Does that make sense to you? They need to be able to read it. That's a critical skill. But that's a whole other video that I can get involved in. Because I just think that it's, it's scary that there are some things that are not being taught in schools anymore when, they're, when kids are young and, and growing up in high school and things. It's very important to write. It's very important to read. And these are two things that are people are slowly getting away from them. And it's, and it's unfortunate because, you know, they say, well, they complain about books and things. And then they're staring at these at these um, these tablets and things like that for hours on end, laptops and computers for hours on end without taking a break to look at an actual book, you know, printed printed paper. That's going to make a whole other difference on your eyes, too. And just being able to help you build up your your skill and stamina on reading and reading long and complex documents right because you can get tired just staring at your screen all day even with the blue light filter on it okay i'm just saying books are very important writing is very important and these are skills that employers are still looking for okay and being able to do basic things like work with the coding manuals is key and again if you have your book all ratted up and and, and tattered and everything because you put tabs all over it the tabs get in your way. Don't argue with me. Because if you say, oh, well, no, that's how I learn. The coding manuals are reference books. They are not workbooks. Even though a lot of you try to treat them like they're workbooks, they are not workbooks. You have to learn to respect them because it has everything in it that it's needed because it's written by doctors and scholars. You, most of the time, are not going to be a doctor or a scholar <laughs> writing anything in these books unless you actually are a doctor or a scholar <laughs> and you're writing something in the book. But for us coders, no. It, it, you just have to learn, again, to use the book itself. And that's my advice there. Um, but I do agree if the, you can't use the coding manual anymore, I do agree that you are a glorified data entry clerk. And there's no reason for that. Because every single one of us as coders is looked at as a subject matter expert by these providers. And if you can't answer a question without depending on the, the encoder or depending on something, you can use it as backup. You can use it as a lead. Uh, but if you can't look things up yourself, there's a problem. Because uh, a few years ago when my facility started using Mako, it's a, it's a joint replacement um, thing right it's computer it's where they're going to scan the joint and it's going to give you the exact measurements because everybody's anatomy is different so it's going to give the exact measurements to the surgeon and they're going to be able to make these very precise cuts and things like that so it's it's really revolutionary it's wonderful it's a wonderful um it's a wonderful use of this device and in this in this whole system but finding the code because when the doctors are describing it, they're describing it in a way that I couldn't find the code in the book. So I had to do research. And even when I'm looking in the book and I'm not seeing it, I had to go to the internet and look up, <laughs> you know, what can I find out about this Mako, you know. And so sure enough, I found out, okay, it's computer assisted. All right, it's not a robot, it's computer assisted. So there was a difference. Uh, when I was looking up the code. And so I was like, oh, well, there's the code, you know. But again, that was me using critical thinking and being able to do all of these things. Again, being able to show that you can use critical thinking is something that these um, these hiring managers are going to, it's going to be like catnip to them because then they're going to say, okay, this person knows how to do their own research and they're, they're not going to wait for somebody to train them. They're not going to wait for somebody to spoon feed them. 
That's another thing too, is that if you can show that you're very independent and that you know how to find things, but that you also know <laughs> when to ask for help, that's also going to be something that's going to put you in a good light. Okay. Because again, people who wait around for things to be spoon fed to them, that's, that's no way to be in this industry. You know, there's a lot of comments that still come in on the channel uh, where there, people are asking me basically to spoon feed them. After I've repeated and repeated and repeated several times, several things, and they're asking the same question again. And sometimes they're asking the very question I'm addressing in the video. I don't respond to those anymore because of the simple fact that I don't have to. It's right there. And if you can't see it, I can't help you. I can't help you. And I won't. Because to me, if I'm, not, if I'm doing that, I'm not helping you grow as a coder, as a future coder. There was somebody that asked me... Um, a few weeks ago where they could uh, find the um, the coding program for on Ahima, the 13 course bundle that they couldn't find it they couldn't find it and I'm like it's there you know and I'm not gonna sit here and give them the exact um, the exact link and sure enough they came back oh I was able to find it good guess what happened now I just made this person a little bit stronger because they actually had to go and dig in there and look and they found it okay so it is possible. Again, every problem has a solution and you have to be a solutions based person in order to be really successful in this field. And that's what it's going to require. That's what it's going to call for. So to wrap this up, <laughs> just so we, we all understand each other, know how to be able to use your book, know how to be able to verbalize how to find a code in the book, all the steps. Okay. Diagnosis and procedures, understand basics of medical terminology, anatomy, pathophysiology. Even if your facility is not asking you these questions, you still need to be able to know. All right, know what your resources are and how to find them. So we're we're talking about like Merck manual, CPT assistant, a coding clinic. These are things that are very important because these are from reputable resources. The Merck manual is. Is one of the founding, <laughs> not founding, but it's one of those foundational uh, books that everybody uses because it's, it's going to tell you everything about the conditions, okay? And even their treatments and the treatment options and the pathophysiology of the conditions. So these are all very important, okay? So those are the things that you need to look at. And whenever the the thought of, oh, well, I, I, I'm just gotten so used to the encoder, Again, I fell into this when I was studying for my CCSP. Of course, many years <laughs> of using the encoder and I lost my speed in the books. And I've talked about that before. Losing your speed in the books is not a good thing. You have to be able to maintain your speed even when you are working with an encoder. Okay, and again, me not really thinking about needing to go for another certification and, you know, change from the CCA to the CCSP first and then the CCS. So <laughs> not thinking about that, I got away from the books for the longest time. And of course, with YouTube and Patreon and all of these things and having to get back into it because of that, you know, now I'm much more faster with the book again. I can get through the book pretty quickly and I can know where to go. So it's something that I would implore you guys to never lose, never lose those skills on how to use the book. Uh, try to keep those notes and tabs off the book as much as possible. Now, if you're working in a clinic and, and you say, well, I write little notes just to kind of remind myself about certain things, that's okay because you're not taking a test again, okay? And this is, this is a reference for you, but just indiscriminately writing notes all over your book just because, oh, so-and-so has this in their book and so-and-so says it's a good thing to, no, no. Because oftentimes when I see writing in people's books, because they'll proudly show them off on the internet, and you don't, you can't even see the code anymore because there's that much writing. It's just like, why would you write so much in the book and highlight and underline and circle and do all this crap to it? Why would you do that when the book already has the answers? You just have to learn how to use the book. I'm just saying. And as you can see, all of my books remain clean. And I, and I still know how to navigate in them. Okay, if you're practicing in them, you won't have any problems navigating in them. I'm just saying. So with that said, guys, um, 
just make sure when you're getting out there, even if you're brand new or you have limited experience, or even if you are a veteran coder that is trying to get into some place new, make sure that you're studying on that particular specialty. If you're applying for a cardiology clinic, then make sure that you review the cardiology guidelines. Make sure that you look at the procedures that are in the cardiology section. Look at those things so that way you can be prepared for any questions that they may ask you. Every place is going to be different when it comes to their questions, guys. There's no way to prepare you. There's no tests that you can get other than the fact that you need to be consistently and continually studying, okay? On my Patreon channel, um, it, Patreon is a lot like YouTube, except that you pay to support the creator, which would be me. And um, all pledges go to continuing uh, to supporting my continued education. So on there, I give um, quizzes and coding exercises and things like that. So that way you can get that extra practice in. There's some uh, procedure notes. There's some E&M scenarios. There's some with just lists of diagnoses to look up. And if you don't take the time to practice with those lists of diagnoses to look up, you're missing out because, again, it's not all about looking at notes, 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 notes. You still have to be able to find those single listed diagnosis codes. If you can't find those single listed diagnosis codes, there's a problem. You're not going to be able to spot those in the big notes, in the op notes, in the, in the uh, E&M notes. You're not going to be able to spot them because you're overlooking and you just want to get to notes, notes, notes. That's how you want to practice. Little do you know that that is practicing. Looking up single diagnosis codes is practice. Looking up single procedure codes or combination procedure codes, that is practice. I'm just saying. So with that said, <laughs> um, the link for my Patreon channel is in the description box below. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. But yes, make sure that you are preparing yourself when you're going out there uh, and you're going in for this interview that you're going to be ready and willing to answer any of their questions. You can bring your books with you, your coding manuals with you. Uh, if you want to, because that's just going to show that you're prepared. And any preparedness that I see, I'm going to be very excited about, okay? <laughs> so uh, that's just uh, just a tip from me to you. So anyway, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. Best of luck to you out there, and I will see you next time. If this video helped you, please like, subscribe, and share, and I'll see you all again. Bye!